Hello everyone. Since I got good feedback from my first recording of this, I wanted to do my next one, which is Classic X-Men number two. We see on the front the X-Men fighting off the evil Annie Men, and we'll see what's going to happen. Inside, we have a resolution because the X-Men have to figure out what they're going to do with so many X-Men. And as I mentioned beforehand, Sunfire, who is not a fan of teams, immediately quits and flies off and tells them they're all a bunch of idealistic fools. However, Banshee, even though he's older and starting to gray, as he puts it, he decides that he's going to stick around. But that's when the bombshell drops. That Angel and Iceman and Jean Grey, the original X-Men, are going to leave. And as you can see, Xavier is quite shocked. And Wolverine, in his usual tactfulness, tells them, just, you know, get out of here. We don't need you. This, of course, as happens with superheroes, nearly leads to a fight. But Cyclops, being the leader, is able to break it up. That night, he is giving one of his epic monologues where he says, Killed by my eyes, my cursed mutant energy-blasting eyes. His dilemma is that he doesn't feel like he could ever have a normal life outside of the X-Men. So even though Jean Grey, Bobby Drake, and all of the original X-Men are leaving, he is going to stay, even if that means not being with Jean Grey, his one true love. They kiss, but it says, the man called Cyclops is alone. Now comes the fun part. The new team has to make their way into the Danger Room. By the way, I apologize. In my last recording, I forgot the name of this young gentleman. That is Thunderbird. Thunderbird, Storm, Wolverine, Banshee, Nightcrawler, and Colossus make their way into the Danger Room, and it immediately attacks them. A giant piece of the wall comes out. Now, Storm and Banshee being able to fly, jump out of the way, Nightcrawler teleports, Wolverine and Thunderbird being very fast are able to dodge out of the way, but Colossus is crushed, to which Nightcrawler says, Ach, du Lieber, and they believe that he has been killed. However, this is when we get our first indication of just how powerful Colossus's armored form is. He is easily able to survive, leaving a little cartoon image of him in the wall. We then get a montage as Cyclops in the control room is leading them through a series of challenges. Giant robots, missile attacks, spikes on the floor, and the narrator tells us Cyclops drives them hard, but himself harder as he takes six proud, unique individuals, six loners, six outcasts, and forges them into a team. But you can only push people so far. Thunderbird is cutting it too close, and his leg is injured by a laser. Banshee is trying to help, but Thunderbird is calling him Shamrock and tells him to back off. He doesn't want to admit that he's been injured, but Xavier breaks in and tells him to report to the infirmary. We see the discussion between Xavier and Cyclops, and Cyclops is having to remind him that these are not young teenagers like the original ones. These are all individuals who will not stand to be treated like children. 
that they have to be forged into a team. We get a quick aside to Moira McTaggart. Some of you might know her from the movies, where she's a very different character in the movies, and young Rain Sinclair, a New Mutant character that will show up later. But the bottom line is, Moira has gotten a letter from Charles Xavier, her old colleague and also her old romantic interest. We cut to Storm flying through the air, thinking about if she's going to fit in in this new land. And that's when she sees Thunderbird leaping off a cliff. She realizes that a jump from that height will kill him, and she uses her wind powers to sweep him back up to safety. She asks him why he's done such a foolish thing, and he tells her that Wolverine made that jump, and she reminds him that Wolverine's bones do not break. And we see the ultimate conflict here is that Thunderbird is feeling inadequate, because even though he is an incredible mutant, he's stronger, he's faster, he's tougher than a normal mutant, there's nothing that he can do that Wolverine can't do better. We cut to chapter two, Death or Valhalla High, and it's in the Cheyenne Mountains, where NORAD's North American Air Defense Command is, and a gentleman gets a package. Inside the package is a small button that says, press me. So of course, being a highly trained military officer, he doesn't press the button. Oh wait, no, he does. And it opens a portal, letting in the Annie Men. Frog Dude, Hawk Dude, Wasp Lady, Cat Dude, and Ape Dude. We'll get some of their names in a little bit. They are easily able to take down the initial guards inside the control room. Behind them comes Count Nefaria. Now, sometimes I hear him called Nefaria, and sometimes I hear him called Nefaria. I'm going to call him Nefaria, and if that's wrong, don't worry about it. I'll probably say it wrong later on. Nefaria has a plan. The reason that he engineered this to get into the control room was he knew that his any men, who used to be human, could easily take out the guards in this control room, but they couldn't hardly fight an entire army. But from the control room, he's able to gas the rest of the soldiers. And we get a quick recap that originally, Count Nefaria, he is one of the Magia, M-A-G-G-I-A. -G -G and I think they may actually show up in some of the Marvel Universe TV shows. I'm not 100% sure. But basically, they're the Mafia with superpowers. <laughs> I think the legend goes that they weren't allowed or were afraid to actually call them the Mafia. And so they chose to call them the Magia instead. But he used Magia science to create these original Annie men that were fairly ridiculous, and the X-Men defeated them in one of the earlier comics. So he's created these new Annie men more powerful to enact his plans. We cut, and by the way, this is one of my favorite comic book panels of all time, is just here is Cyclops, and he's in this incredibly must be uncomfortable outfit, and he's just chillaxing. He's just relaxing on the sofa chair, thinking about times before. And that's when Nightcrawler comes to talk to him. And they're starting to make friendships. They're starting to get to know each other. But that is interrupted by none other than Count Nefaria, who's giving his demands now that he sees control of the Valhalla base. He says that he has a very simple proposal. Every single nation on Earth will pay him. And I, I like the, how reasonable he is. He says that they'll all pay me uh, in accordance to their ability to pay. So, you know, Liechtenstein won't have to pay as much as the United States. Very reasonable of him. But if all of them don't, he will launch America's entire inventory of nuclear missiles and destroy the Earth. 
we get a cut in to Beast. This is the original X-Men Beast, who has now blue and furry, and very rightly so, he's surprised at the new X-Men, since he used to be teammates with the old ones. But what he's saying is that the Avengers are involved in another caper at this moment, and that they can't interfere, and so they want to know if the X-Men can. We see the X-Men flying in. Unsurprisingly, the military is not super happy about an unmarked blackbird that is flying into airspace during a high tense moment, but they are able to make their bona fides that they work with the Avengers. The general uh, on the ground is basically saying, hey, you know what, why don't you go for it? We are not getting in. Uh, as he goes forward, Magia uh, science leader Count Nefaria is just so pleased because he wasn't planning on fighting the X-Men. This isn't about fighting the X-Men. He was just trying to make lots and lots of money. He is so happy that the X-Men are here, though, because he gets to kill them. The rockets fly off. They are able to maneuver away, but one last rocket manages to get them. The Blackbird is falling. The only chance is Cyclops is able to eject the front pod of the Blackbird. This will, I believe, mark the first time the Blackbird is destroyed, one of many. However, <clears throat> Nefaria is not super happy about that. In fact, he says, no, by all that's unholy, the X-Men still live. How many times must I kill them before those cursed mutants stay dead? He hits a unexplained moment a uh, button, a sonic disruptor. Sounds like something from Doctor Who. And it simply disintegrates the airplane and leaves the X-Men to fall to their death. And that ends classic X-Men number two. But we get a second story. And this was my favorite part about classic X-Men growing up. This all is a reprint of the original X-Men from the 70s. But this is an extra story that helps tell more about the characters. It's called first friends and we see storm that's aurora monroe and she's flying in to visit her friend jean gray jean gray has a enormous apartment in new york which is inexplicable even in the 70s uh even having a roommate there is no explanation how she could afford this place unless charles xavier is helping her but that's just one of those little comic things we we go ahead and deal with. However, while uh, they're there, she says, oh, uh, we're going to go out shopping, so you had better change into your regular clothes. What she doesn't realize is that Storm has no modesty whatsoever. It says there's a flash of lightning, and then Storm is completely naked, um, <laughs> to which, of course, Jean Grey is somewhat surprised. She gets her into a robe while she gets some clothes for her. Um, and of course, as they do in X-Men, when they do it properly, they show off powers and they show Jean Grey levitating a dress to Storm and uh, reminding her that she is a telekinetic along with being a telepath. She puts on the clothes and that's when they get a nice little moment where they meet Misty Knight. Any of you who have watched the recent Luke Cage will recognize Misty Knight. One important difference in this one is that she has a bionic arm, which we will actually get to in a later extra series in the classic X-Men. However, they are off to do shopping, but while they're out shopping, having ice cream, got their bags, having a wonderful time, a young hoodlum in a skateboard knocks them over and steals Jean Grey's purse. Now, of course, Jean Grey is not going to let this stand, but the young hoodlum handle heads down the subway. And this is where we get the first backstory that Storm is horribly claustrophobic. And we'll get into exactly why that is in a later episode. But you can see the image distorting. She is terrified to go down inside. Inside, though, Jean Grey is able to grab him. Unfortunately, she does not take into account. She's so focused on getting this young individual that 
the subway has arrived and dozens of people walk out not having her shields up properly she is overwhelmed by the psychic impressions and this causes her to lose the young man she comes back upstairs and she's angry she doesn't understand why storm who's an x-men after all didn't come up to help her and storm is trying to explain and that's when jean gray sees it she says small wonder i can see the memory crystal is clear you were buried alive as a child your mother died right beside you oh aurora how awful unfortunately this is the wrong thing to say because storm is furious at having her memories invaded in that way she turns uh, into her costume and creates a storm high above jean gray is swept up however she is able to float using her telekinesis and storm is coming to confront her and she's saying how she had no right to pry into her private thoughts she thought jean gray was a friend and that's when jean gray explains to her what it's like to be a telepath do you imagine I like being privy to others' thoughts? When you're a telepath, the problem isn't reading minds. It's not reading them. To keep those psyches out of your own so you can grab a little peace and quiet for yourself. She didn't do it on purpose. It's just that the thought was so loud. She couldn't help but hear it. Storm realizes he might have slightly overreacted. Stops the storm and they both float down all the clothes that they had purchased have been ruined jean gray is saying some can be salvaged the rest can be replaced and as scarlett o'hara said tomorrow is another day jean gray reaches out her hand to aurora as a friend and together facing her fears they walk down into the subway and that is the final end of classic X-Men number two. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will talk to you soon.